Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage we're following up on the warning lights that were all over the dashboard on my Freelander 2. Hi everyone, well, those of you who didn't watch in detail the previous video, what's happened is the Freelander's been throwing all sorts of errors and messages on the dashboard. I'd got messages dropping in and out about uh, tyre pressures being low. I'd also got issues being flagged up as gearbox fault, um, communication lost with Haldex units, uh, traction control unavailable, terrain response modes unavailable, the whole gamut. Um, the fact that I'd got so many was kind of reassuring to me in that all those systems have not broken. We checked it out and with a bit more tyre pressure I was able to get most of the tyre pressure warnings to go off but not one. Um, then I drove the car an awful lot, then it disappeared, then it came back, checked the pressures, pressures were okay. I was absolutely 100% sure that it was, it was the pressure sensors themselves that were giving issues because the tyres weren't changing in pressure to any great degree however a little later on what i discovered is that my entire collection of tire pressure checking gizmos was a bit rubbish so i've got the inflator oops get stuck uh, the inflator that i use on my compressor which generally is the thing i go by I've later decided that that is out by four to five PSI and it reads higher than the actual pressure is. I do have this alternate old school style inflator, um, which when attached to the airline and you're pumping your tires up, this area here pops out and you can read the pressure off. But um, I only really own it as a, a spare, and B, because it's such an old and interesting gadget, the actual hose and the rubber seal on the end of this is quite poor. It really needs replacing. So I haven't really got that to utilize. Then I'd got my three, yes, I have three separate tire pressure gauges, I thought. Um, I got this one and it looks quite pretty. Um, I'm looking for the brand name on it. It's quite old. PCL um, seems to be the brand name. I had it in my drawer for a while. The actual plunger that's supposed to pop out and read is seized in the body. That shows how little that use that's had. I've got this one, very similar, which is probably my best reading, and we is the device that sort of warned me that my tire inflator was probably reading optimistic by about four PSI. And this one is a Romac, and that does what it's supposed to do, which is this little thimble. Let me use a, a surface to help with focusing. Put some lights on as well. Thimble pops out got your pressures written on it and you read them off to the uh, area where they come out of this barrel that's probably the most accurate but getting old the seal in there has hardened up and you're losing as much as you're checking so it was doing the job but irritating and this which i thought oh well i, I can check these against that um yeah, not so good. Face drops off. Needle can be anywhere you like. Depending where it starts is where it takes its reading from. So something's obviously come loose inside there. So all junk, if I'm honest. That can go in the bin. I need to replace my inflator for my compressor. I will keep the Romag um, gauge because very nice got a little leather sleeve for that and i'll see if i can 
change out the little rubber um, seat in there. That, oh, that's not for the camera. <laughs> I'm struggling. Wow. Well, by the time we get it out, it will be junk for sure. I can get it to twitch, so it will come. There we go. You can see the white corrosion that's built up on it and jammed it up. But I'm not obviously not going to trust that thing anyway, and it's... It's not even the same category as his Romag one. You can just tell this this is quite nicely made. This is a sort of fake of this. These are quite nifty as well. Like pull that out. Got a valve core remover. So, but these have uh, real downsides, even if they're working properly because depending on how your spokes are on your wheel, they sit quite vertically. You can have this colliding uh, with parts of your wheel. You really got to position it um, the same way on every tire, because if, if you're doing it right, this should be going up. If you do it horizontally, there's less effort to push this out. If you're doing it down, then obviously gravity helps. So they're not perfect, but as quick, easy, convenient, pretty things, they are very nice. So I got myself an actual half decent tire pressure gauge. I'll put a link in the description. Um, why did I choose this? Not stupid expensive, some are. Um, good reviews. Comes with a, a calibration. So this is actually approved to British standards. Probably not, but somebody's at least gone to the effort of trying and given it a date and it's a, a you know, unique document. Came with some valve caps and adapters. So you can do Schrader valves and Presta valves. And what I thought was quite nifty, it's got the same similar sort of push on uh, adapter as the Romag, but it rotates on a nice pivot, and that means you can always get onto a valve. This is not always going to be in the way. It reads the value and holds the high point, and you press the button to let the needle go back to zero or to deflate the tyre. And lastly, uh, reads all the way up to 60 PSI, so this is okay for doing some of the heavier vehicles, commercials. Um, but the gauge is also a luminescent one, so in low light levels that can be really, really handy. And it's reading in PSI and in bar, which are the two most common values that you'll see on tyres, certainly in the UK. And I'll recheck the tyre pressures uh, today because... I did everything in the dark and rather quickly. What I recognised is the tyres are supposed to be at um, either 32 or 34, depending on load. And the tyres were probably all at just under 32, i.e. on the edge of triggering their alarms, even though I'd pumped them up thinking, well, I've got 36 in there. So we'll set the tyres correctly and the lights are off for um for tire pressures that should mean they stay off all of the other lights have actually also disappeared they did come back again but then after a very short trip and a turn off disappeared again and have not come back so what this is telling me is it is possible but it, this system is so sensitive to rolling diameter that the traction control, um, road speed sensors, etc., are sending conflicting messages to the car's brain and going, you're spinning a wheel or I'm broken 
because the diameters are not identical due to tire pressure or there is water in the electrical connection going to the Haldex unit uh, or wheel speed sensors because the car has waded through some big floods quite recently and just intermittently bad connections are causing it. So I'm going to quickly pop the Landy in the garage, lift her up, have a look at the electrical connections, going to the clever diff, give everything a bit of a clean up and see how we get on. And you're also going to see if the lights come back on when I start her now. So, plenty of twitching around and manoeuvring there. No warning lights. Looking promising. Now you don't need to obviously jack a car up to do what I'm doing there. I just can, and it's so easy, but I do for convenience of height, convenience of filming. And uh, I can shuffle underneath and check the electrical connections really easy. So let's check out these tires. Uh, so if I go on, just thinking of an angle for you guys. If I go on like that, seals nicely holds the pressure and it's coming down a bit now that's not so good let's give it a few goes eh well that's very disappointing So this leaks down rather quickly. All right, I'll look at that in a bit. Most important for now is I check the pressures. <sighs> Fraction under 34. You don't need to watch me to do, the, do the others. I'll be back in a moment. The good news is the tyres are all about the same. They're about 33, so probably give them a, another pound. Uh, not bad news, but at least I've discovered it. There's a little join there. You can see the pressure leaking back. I don't know if you can. The bubbles. I sprayed WD-40. It's gone there. There you go. WD-40 on the um, seats, thinking maybe it'll help them just to reseal. I can see where the leak down is. So it's probably just that. So I'll nip that up. We'll try again. And that's pretty solid. So yeah, it's far better than anything I've got. Build quality probably wasn't perfect or assembly quality wasn't perfect. But uh, yeah, with a little bit of tweaking, we're back to having a really good gauge. Okay, we're just going to pop under the car now and have a look, see what the electrical connectors look like on the uh, Haldex clutch. Okay, for many of you, this will be the first time underneath a Freelander or an LR2 if you're in North America. Um, Let's have a little look. So we've got this big silencer hanging sideways at the back. 
best place from a ground clearance point of view. You don't want to be reducing your ground clearance. So big ass silencer. You can see where it's not been painted and on the seal and bits and pieces. It's bright meaning, but it's a anti-corrosive material. And here's where all the Land Roverness begins. So Land Rovers, if you're not a four by four person, are renowned the world over for being exceptionally capable off-road. Uh, Land Rover brand is essentially based on that. The uh, ability to go off-road in the most extreme of environments over and above ride quality on road it's a bit like um jeep wrangler in that sense except all of the land rover products kind of a sub brand are aiming for that sort of market to different degrees defender is top of the tree and then um, discovery is certainly of late are getting very close to being what we call Chelsea tractors. So bling machines that just happen to be brilliant off-road, but they're, they're more about road. Freelander sort of lives somewhere in the middle. It's a smaller, slightly more affordable Land Rover, but um, compromises by not having low ratio box, but in many other regards is right up there in its abilities. So, we got hubs with drive shafts leading to a diff. We've got one, two, three arms controlling it, and they are very significant arms running fore and aft. We've also got sensors to detect articulation, depending on model, and what modes you're in, they could be as simple as just looking after headlight alignment to part of the terrain response system, dealing with how the car copes once wheels come off the ground, etc. Freelanders are renowned for being able to drive with two wheels wagging in the air. Um, the car knows that that's happening and deals with it. And then this diff has a bit of an extension over what we might see on the average car to allow for this unit. This is your Haldex clutch. And it's quite a clever unit. Um, it's the same unit, I believe, that is used on the Volvo XC90 or 60, not quite sure, um, because the Freelander 2 came out when we still had the Premier Automotive Group, which was part of Ford. So although this had previously been on Freelander 1 in a slightly different guise, when Freelander 2 came out, they used the underpinnings of the Freelander 2 for Volvo. And um, yeah, I think there's a few other vehicles that use very, very similar systems. So the rear axle and its drive comes from a prop shaft that goes forward and this is essentially a front wheel drive setup with a power takeoff system. So when our drive comes down to here, it enters the Haldex clutch. The Haldex clutch uses the same sort of clutch you might find on a motorcycle or deep within an automatic gearbox, which is multiple friction plates between metal plates and it uses a hydraulic actuation to switch on, switch off or slip the drive that's coming from this prop shaft, which is permanent, to the back axle. The way that it does that, it has a strong but very small hydraulic pump which takes oil from within the casting and applies extreme pressure to it. It pushes it, this is the really clever bit in my opinion, 
into this thing up here, which is called an accumulator. And if you think that of that as a battery for hydraulics, you wouldn't be very far off. It pushes that oil pressure into here, which contains some extraordinarily strong springs and pushes the oil to compress them. It's actually that oil under pressure that is used to actuate the clutch when it's needed, not the pump's pressure. So this is topping up or resetting this sort of spring-loaded reservoir of oil, meaning that when this bit, Haldex module, decides that the clutch needs to be solidly engaged, the reaction time is tiny because we're not pumping up pressure. We're just opening a valve momentarily and releasing massive oil pressure behind this spring. You, there is no user serviceable part in the accumulator. You should never try and disassemble that. Um, if you do, you might lose uh, limbs or knock a hole in your garage wall. So that's meant to be sealed for life. This bit is looking at pressures. It's taking signals from the brain of the car. It's sending signals to the valves. It's looking at oil temperatures. It's doing all sorts of nice, clever stuff. And if you were to disassemble that, it's sealed up um, with gaskets and there's oil inside as well as the electronics. And here on the back, we have two electrical connectors. There's a two wire one and a multiple wire one. Multiple wire ones, the sort of communications thing, and the two wire one is just power for your pump. Now, it said on the dashboard, lost communication with HDC, Haldex clutch. So, this, I think, has just been immersed in water and has caused me a few issues. So what I'm going to do, I might need two hands for this, is squeeze that clip um, whilst pushing this further home and then pull it off. And the same with that one. And we'll just have a look, see what they look like. So, yeah, I'm going to need two hands. I'm at full reach and my grip isn't quite enough. So I've got to say, they don't look like they've been swamped. But neither are they perfectly clean. So yeah, a little inconclusive, I've got to say, but it'll have done no harm to take them off and reinsert them because that will help clean the contacts. But well, I've got some contact cleaner somewhere down here. Let's have a look. There we go. Probably a contact cleaner. So I'm going to work around that, just give everything a good clean up, uh, reinsert and remove these a few times. And uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, so they're uh, been on and off several times. Plenty of cleaner been on them. This stuff evaporates off real fast. Just giving it a flick to make sure anything that's stuck to them is going to drop off. And now I'm going to pop them back on. And you see how easily they slide in. He says, covering it with his hands. There we go, I heard a click. Try and pull it off without touching that top bit of that clip. Nothing. Push it back again. Same with this one. On, I had a good click, won't come off. Little wobble, little wobble. So, doesn't feel like I've done a lot down there, but maybe it'll make a difference. Maybe I'd already solved the problem with the tire pressures. This drive shaft, the uh, paint or coating around it is horrendously flaking off. So that suggests that's original. I don't know, 
play in it where I can feel. Got something for me to bear in mind. Drive boot seeming good, Nick. There's going to be some of you in dry climates looking under the un underside of this car and said, you said this was a good one, John. I live in the UK. This is very normal. This cross member does look a bit crusty, I've got to say. Car is nine, ten years old. But it is just flaky paint. I mean, this looks terrible on the anti-roll bar. But uh, it is just paint. Well, I know that was a bit basic, but I genuinely think that's probably the issue. If it wasn't, then the next most likely is tyre pressures as basic as that. Um, I will put another PSI in each of the tyres just to make sure we're at the right level, because they all seem to be about 33 using my new gauge, and 34 is the target. And then I'll bring her down, get her outside and just check that no lights are coming on. Whilst I've been up in the air, I have um, given all the wheels a bit of a turn and, you know, see if we can detect any bearing play and um, anything like that. But there's, there doesn't feel like there's anything. I'm just doing that because it's in the air rather than because there's an issue. But of course, it's a 4x4 vehicle. Um, everything's linked up and you've got a lot of drag in there so it is a bit difficult to feel um or hear more more likely any issues like that on these sorts of vehicles well no warning lights no tire pressures uh so you won't really know until i've driven the land rover for some while to find out what's really going on but it looks like it is just uh, tire pressures and all them connectors getting wet. So, I'll catch you up again soon on what we're up to on to the garage. Bye! If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.